is Control Structure, episode 121, for July 11th, 2017. This podcast cannot be run in DOS mode. This show has notes. Visit thenexus.tv slash cs121 to see them. I am Andrew Bailey, and you are... I am Steve Norvis. So, uh, Christmas happened. It did happen. And it got very cold. It did get very cold. So, story about that. Uh, on Saturday, I was out hunting uh, muzzleloader uh, for deer, and uh, I hunted like the first half of the day, and it was cold, but it wasn't that bad. And then about 10.30 at night, I went out to check my traps, and uh, I got kind of halfway around, and I was like, well, my hands are pretty cold. I mean, normally they don't get cold when you're walking, because the blood's moving, and it's pretty good. Exactly. Anyways, I got back to the house, and apparently the temperature is 8 degrees, and that's why I got so cold. Were you wearing gloves? I was wearing gloves, and I had Thinsulate liners in them, too. Like, typically, unless you're sitting, that keeps you warm. Yeah. Normally. Yeah. So, uh, let's see. It wasn't uh, this past Sunday. It was the Sunday before last that, um, uh, like, you know, you've seen that I have this sort of, like, bike rack in the basement that makes my bike a stationary bike. Yes. So, um... And then the grill outside, uh, well, I put on some casserole uh, on the grill. Then I went downstairs and did the bike thing for about an hour. Came back up, and the grill was saying, error. And I'm like, okay, that's weird. So I go out and check. The grill is cold, and it was working when I went downstairs like an hour before. So I'm like, okay. Um, I'm not sure what happened, but, I mean, you know, just like went out or something, so... You know, put it on, like, low, like, maybe, like, a 225 degrees or so, or maybe, like, a 180, and, uh, so I do that, uh, come back inside, and, you know, it, it go starts going, and then over the next, like, three minutes, it really gets going, because, like, I'm turning back, and the temperature is just going up and up and up, because there's a temperature readout on the grill, and, like, after a while, I was looking at it, and I could just see it, like, counting upwards, you know? So I'm like, okay, this might not be good. So I go outside and, you know, you know, open it up and wonder, you know, it's like, what's going on? So despite the fact that there's, like, two plates of metal, like, between the bottom and where the food is, about a minute later, there is flames shooting out of the grill. So, like, it completely engulfs the, uh, the casserole dishes. Like, the food doesn't catch fire, but, like, there's fire all around. So, uh, then I realized that, you know, the flames had gone out before, and the grill just kept on pushing the pellets into, uh, into the grill, and it was just burning all that off now. So, uh, uh, yeah, like, my rather light colored casserole dishes were all black they did look a nice deep dark black <laughs> yeah and like all the grease and the grease trap caught fire oh wow okay so more wonderful so yeah it had a nice uh not quite burnt taste but definitely a very uh smoky <laughs> flavor uh so uh yeah that was uh that was kind of fun uh, yeah, and then, yeah, I went back to my parents' place for Crick's Mix, and, you know, everyone survived, I guess. You guess? <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, as for my own stuff, uh, like, you know, the Steam sale, did you get anything on the Steam sale? Uh, no, actually, there was only one game came up that was on my wish list, and it was, like, some sort of, a. Uh... Water Two Fighter game, and I was like, eh, I don't really play games much anymore, so I passed on it. So I bought the Fallout 4 DLC uh, back at its original price of like $30, uh, because like uh, before the first DLC came out, Bethesda were a bunch of dicks and upped the price from like 30 to 50 Haha. <laughs> so it you know was on sale for its original price, I'm like, I like this game sufficiently. I went ahead and bought it. And then over on uh, Good Old Games, uh, had sales going on, so I bought the Witcher 3 DLC. So I'm going through that right now. Um, but then uh, I got some uh, RTSs for 20th Century. So, uh, like, Warcraft, like, I think Warcraft 2 and Age of Empires. 
thought you had Warcraft. Uh, I don't know. No, 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 no. I'm thinking of a different game. Okay. So the Warcraft. It's Starcraft. Stuff, yeah, that's probably what it was. Very Too many different. crafts. <laughs> Very so, different. So Warcraft's the one where there's like an online community. You can go and make stuff and sell things to people and like trade and stuff. Uh, not really, unless you're talking about World of Warcraft. That's pro- that's the other craft I'm talking about. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, so so Warcraft is like the original RTS, like before Warcraft got really big. Okay. So, uh, uh, like I was playing through that on the 20th century, and I was sort of alternating back and forth between that and like the first Age of Empires, which, you know... Like, I remember uh, my friend giving it to me, like, ten years ago, and somehow it did not seem as hard, but, like, I guess since I'm playing it on normal that it expects you to know the game a little bit better, and, like, general RTS kind of strategies won't exactly work, and it's driving me nuts. Like, <laughs> there's there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, how should I say, maps or scenarios on there going through the campaign that I remember distinctly this one where you have a priest and I think you're supposed to go over to one of the other guys' base and convert a villager, then steal him away and, like, use him to make your own base. Okay. But uh, that doesn't exactly work on, like, normal difficulty. So it's just too hard to do? Yeah. <laughs> So they, like, made the game so, impossible to play. So, like, I put it down, like, uh, I think it might have been on easiest or something. So I got the villager, and, you know, I can see, like, the guy coming out towards him. So I, you know, run him and the priest away from the base. Except the priest is really slow. <laughs> but he eventually regains enough, uh, like, energy uh-huh. to convert the guy who's running after them. <laughs> stop chasing us <laughs> so so not only do i get a villager out of it i have like an axe man out of it <laughs> yeah okay, that's funny and you know i kind of build up like a nice base and it might just have been like my build and gather order that like that wasn't even enough you know like they send over a trickle of guys and i'm not sure if like, all the other people on the map are fighting each other, and I just, like, so happen to be in the middle of all of it. Oh, and you just, like, have all these guys come to fight you all the time? Pretty much. On the way to each other's base. Aha, I see. So, and I think, like, another few uh, scenarios were like that, but I managed to uh, overcome the difficulties. It's fun playing the older uh, games like that. Have you ever played uh, 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 Sid Meiser's Gettysburg? Gettysburg, no. Yeah, that's a pretty fun game. It's like, I pretty much haven't played any of Sid Meier's games. Okay. Or any of the games named after him or whatever. Ah, uh, see, this is this is where we're very different. I've played a fair number of his games. I've I've played Civ Five, and that's pretty much it. Okay. And not even for that long, but uh, yeah. So yeah, I have this uh, break of RTS in between my RPG of like Witcher and Fallout. There you go. So yeah. So, uh, speaking of things on sale during Christmas time, I, uh, found around Christmas time that 3dlabprint.com had their airplanes on sale for, uh, the, it was 20% off. These are... Can you speak into the Microsoft? Yes, I can speak in the Microsoft. So, anyways, they had them on sale. These aren't, uh, just normal airplanes. There are sea airplanes, and they aren't kits you, you buy and get in the mail. They're actually, uh... A, a, a file that you download from the internet, and uh, obviously you print it. That's uh, what happens. Uh, they give you the precise G code, which I thought was pretty neat. Anyways, I got the P thirty eight that they have, and it prints in like I think it's like eleven or twelve prints it had. So I printed it in one week's time. I printed this last week, and it's pretty neat. You glue it together, and its wingspan's about as long as your arms are. Like it's cool, pretty big. It, it's a pretty fun build. Uh, so yeah, I've been playing with that, and maybe I'll uh, finish gluing it up here soon. So that was my uh, my Christmas deal I got in on. Cool. So uh, this is like from way long ago. Uh, that one, I guess, essay or story, coding sucks. That was like pretty much this depressive rant about how programmers like are supposed to you know maintain everything and nobody understands. Because, you know, it was like, oh, you sit in an office all day. 
<laughs> like you're you're not out in you know the salt mines of Mordor for 400 hours a week. I, I do remember that article. Yes. So this this guy comes back and uh, apparently he sends very interesting things to recruiters. <laughs> Maybe a little mildly disturbing, but... Uh... So I, I had a favorite one that he sent. So this is... Uh, I'll start with a letter from the recruiter. It says, Hey, Peter, here at blank, we are working with those on the cutting edge of NYC's tech startup community. Since I haven't heard back from you, that tells me one of three things. You're fighting an intergalactic war to protect the future of mankind. You can't respond because you are in the middle of an awesome vacation. You have over 8,000 unread emails. Regardless, I'd love to connect, even if it's to build a relationship slash talk about future opportunities. Perhaps you a couple minutes to chat next week. That is their grammar. Yes. Worst case scenario, it's a great networking experience. Could you let me know which is closest, which is closest to the truth? And uh, he answers, Dearest Jordan, the front is hard, I cannot lie. A sergeant was killed along with half our platoon this last week while on duty guarding the stockade. I don't know what sort of world this is when a man can die so violent a death on the most of mundane duties. I suppose there's no safe place in war. No matter the address of the star system, in war we live in the hearts of men, and I have come to believe there is no safety to be found in those hearts. Not all is darkness, I remain in good health. And they promoted John to Corporal, though he does not know it yet. The men and I intend to surprise him with a cake made of what we can spare from our rations. And our rations are not mean as they were last year. Yet I fear this is a small favor hiding an unnecessary call to arms. David's leave was cancelled and our general seems almost obsessed with his latest campaign. I cannot in good conscience entertain your offer while the war continues. <laughs> I am optimistic that I will see the end of my tour, tour, and as I am stationed on the most powerful battle station in the galaxy, the rebels will fall, and I will put thoughts of war behind me and seek new employ. I must return to my post. We have located the rebel base. Soon this will all be behind us. I hope to make the winter celebrations. But if I do not, let Cesariel know that I am safe, even in the far reaches of space. Yours in arms... One nine 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 eight two one zero B. That was the best one he had. Yeah, definitely. And that's how he all of them sarcastic back because the guy was kind of sarcastic to him. He's like, "You're on the front fighting intergalactic war." <laughs> he asked for it. Then there's another good one in there where uh, he he writes this giant story. It's like three paragraphs long, and at the end he's like, "Uh." <laughs> Oh, uh, what was it? Something that's like, I'd rather that to happen to me than, than to work at your place or something like or that. Or I would rather be that guy's boyfriend oh, than yes. work in the ad industry again. That's what it was. <laughs> so. Yeah, very, very uh, inventive and descriptive uh, uh, writing here. Apparently he has time on his hands to uh, play with them. This is like a write a scammer type of things. Something like that, like yeah. The, I, I, I showed you that with the, the James Beach, I think it was, with the... The right back to scammers. Yeah. And now for LOL LG. <laughs> Do you remember Google TV? Google TV. It rings a bell. Yeah, it was one of the things that they've killed. Uh, or at least, if they haven't killed, it's kind of flopped. It's gonna and, be killed? Yeah, it's it's pretty much on the chopping block if it already hasn't been. So, uh, like, that pretty much happened around, like, 2013 or so. Mm -hmm. So this guy uh, decides to get one of these. And, you know, it seemed like he liked it, but... Uh, apparently, he uh, upgraded his TV since then, since 2013, uh, because, uh, you know, something else came out or something. So he gave this to one of his family members. And over Christmas, they said, hey, uh, the TV is not really working right because it has it's been infected with ransomware. And, you know, it has, you know, this sort of FBI notice that's like completely bogus. And uh, so he's trying to, you know, figure it out of how to do, like, a factory reset on this. And, like, he can't find anything, so he calls up LG support, and even though it's Christmas Day, he gets someone, and uh, they eventually tell him, 
that they have to send someone out in, just in order to do a factory reset on the thing. So that would be like $300. So he's like, this is like totally not right. And he puts it on Twitter. Uh, so this essentially goes viral. So this was you know, posted on the uh, 25th of December. It has 3,500 uh, retweets and like almost 3,000 likes. So yeah, this pretty much blew up. And uh, fortunately, LG realized that this was a fail and uh, you know, messaged the guy back and said, uh, oh, this is you know, <laughs> pretty much how you do it. You know, it's essentially like hold down two buttons and then release. And then it, you know, goes to like a super secret boot menu where, you know, you can wipe things, you can load on a new ROM or what have you. So, uh, you know, he posted a YouTube video of him doing that. So uh, it seems like it's back to normal now. And you and everyone knows how to uh, do a factory reset on their TV. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Meanwhile, some service technician is having a very terrible fa- Christmas with his family because he did not get three hundred dollars, <laughs> or or the company could not charge someone three hundred dollars on his behalf or something. Something. So, um, yeah, that pretty much brings us full circle to it's like these Internet of Things don't really don't usually have that much security on them, so uh, you know they can get uh, attacked pretty uh, uh pretty frequently which uh that reminds me i totally forgot to put in the fact that uh, uh what was it the ftc is suing d-link over essentially like unsecured things uh like uh, routers and cameras uh to be specific yeah so apparently the government has finally taken notice of like these internet of things and you know like people lying uh, to, you know, essentially everyone that is like, oh, yeah, like, all this is secure and it's easy to set up and, you know, you don't really have to worry about anything. Uh, so the FTC has essentially sued, I think it's pretty sure it's D-Link, you know, over, you know, not having secure things over products released over the past 10 years. That's good. That'll get attention to people and maybe make them actually be serious about uh, being serious. So, hey, speaking about routers, uh, I run OpenWRT on my router, uh, and I found out that it works a lot better than whatever Western Digital had put on it. Uh, like, it, that, the old stuff, like, crashed, you know, occasionally, but ever since, you know, I put OpenWRT on there, it's fine. And, in fact, the uptime of my router is, like, scaringly high. You know, like, I haven't, you know, touched it in months. Which is what a good router should be. Yes. And, like, I haven't even unplugged it or anything. Like, you know, I'd probably have to log in and figure out, you know, what in the world, Mm. you know, is going on. But, uh, so the people behind WRT, uh, quite a few of them, uh, forked, uh, you know, essentially said, fork you, WRT, and uh, created LEAD, L-E-D-E. And, uh, apparently that's, like, a little bit more actively developed, but, uh, apparently they, uh, they realize, you know, what in the world's going on, and they are discussing maybe merging back together with OpenWRT. I had heard that for a time OpenWRT had been not active development, that it had, uh, kind of died off, so this must explain Well, maybe why that slowed was. down, maybe yeah. slowed down a little, but DDWRT. Uh, maybe that's what I was thinking of. Yeah. I think I may have mentioned it at some point. Uh, yeah, according to Wikipedia. Ah, see, it is DDWRT, because that's what I use. I use DDWRT. Yes, yeah, stable release uh, eight years ago. Uh, that is kind of unacceptable. <laughs> cause it's probably th- about when I flashed that router. <laughs> because, uh, you, know, th- you know, the internet has kind of changed mm. since then, and, like, there's lots of insecurities going around since then. Like, lots of... TLS stuff from back then is now totally I, broken now. All the stuff we uh, talked about in this past year and stuff. And uh, there was that uh, one memory corruption bug in Linux that's been around since really before then. One. Since before ever. So, uh, yeah. So, Firebug. Uh, do you use Firebug? 
Uh, no, I don't. Uh, I used to, uh, but when uh, there was like this one post, pretty much comparing Firebug to like the Firefox Dev Tools, like when that started to get mm-hmm. really good, that's when I switched over. You realized it was about the same. Yeah, it was like practically the same, and I thought you know, uh, Firebug development had essentially stopped, but uh, apparently it has not. It has been a thing up until now. Uh, so, uh, with the advent of electrolysis, there has been quite a bit of problems with, uh, Firebug, you know, being, you know, okay with, uh, you know, running in electrolysis and, like, actually doing what it's supposed to be doing. But the Firefox dev tools has no such issue. So they actually decided to join up, like, officially. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's good to, you know, I guess have like one kind of development for that, uh, you know, especially in light of this, you know, it was kind of accidental to have like all these bugs come up for something that's for a feature that's kind of been fundamental to every other browser for about 10 years. So, and that, uh, fundamental improvement being, you know, like, you know, having multiple processes running your browser. Yeah, that's a kind of a nice thing. So had they actually flipped the switch? Remember we talked about that a while back about them flipping the switch. I think by now, like, half of everyone should be running it, uh, but they haven't, like, actually split out the per-process tabs yet. Okay. So there's just, like, a main, like, sort of UI process, then, like, an internal, then another process to handle the internal tab stuff. So, like, if one tab crashes, Mm -hmm. like, all the tabs will, but, like, you know, there will still be something there to say, okay, let's, like, reload this. Yeah. So, uh, cool. So we got uh, encrypted uh, drives, we have encrypted phones, uh, we have encrypted connections, uh, we have a lot of encrypted things, but uh, say you have a camera and you go and film some like political activist or something, and um, you're kind of concerned about you know the safety of your uh, sources, but the uh like the media in the camera is not encrypted so uh that that would be a kind of unfortunate situation if you were like leaving the country and the customs officials in this autocratic dictatorship decide to you know seize your camera Whoops. and uh figure out like where all these political activists are and like what they've you know been saying and stuff so uh like a lot of filmmakers have petitioned uh Canon and Nikon to start selling encrypted cameras, which, you know, how should I say this? This is kind of a late development, you know, because uh, phones, you know, have cameras and Mm. phones have been encrypted for like two or three years now. I feel like it just got kind of overlooked because cameras are still there and I think they're here to stay, but they just don't get the hype like they used to, I feel like. Yeah. So... Uh, I think this is overdue, and pretty much everyone has known this, I'd say. Yeah. So, uh, good on them. So, uh, you know, you just sometimes browse around Wikipedia. Huh. You know, just uh-huh. you know, as you do. And uh, so, I was poking around and found out, like, why uh, cameras lay out the file system the way that they do. You know, because, like, when you plug in a camera, there's always a DCIM folder. Yes, I remember when I was little, I uh, got a few different cameras, and I was so impressed that they had coordinated how to how to order their file system, because they were so neat and standard, it was really nice, I thought. So, like, what, what really kind of gets a little, I want to say creepy, but sort of, uh, I guess I was, not, maybe not unusual either, but kind of weird how like every camera, regardless of manufacturer, follows the same standard. So uh, there is a reason for that, and the reason is the design rule for camera file system. So that pretty much lays out, you know, like what the folder should be named, the folder structure, the file name structure, and like all the other things. So yeah, here's the uh, the method to the madness, I guess. So, uh, why don't you tell us about Word? Uh, I just downloaded it just now, actually, on my uh, Linux desktop here while we were talking. It was only a, like a 6 or 8 meg download. It was pretty fast, actually. So, what is this? 
This is Microsoft Word Win 1.1, the source code. Remember on back they released, uh, we talked about them releasing DOS, an early version of DOS, yeah. on the uh, inter, whatever, some sort of internet library. Let me see what the na- official name of it is. The ComputerHistory.org? Yeah, Computer yeah. History Museum. So, of course, you have to agree not to make a commercial product out of this, not to repost it on the internet and things like that. Uh, but, yeah, so you can actually download the open source code of uh, Microsoft Office, the early version, and see how they built it, which is pretty neat, you know? I I am uh, browsing for something interesting right now. Oh, they have their, their make file. How about that? That's pretty interesting. How old? Uh, how old? Was it 80-something, 80 88? Let me see. Let's find out. I think it was like 90s. Uh, 91, 91. Yeah. 1.1a. 1.1a. Yeah, I think this has three different versions on it. There's like a, like a developer version and like what version they sold and a few different things like that. Oh, they have a stack overflow error. Isn't that, isn't that <laughs> nice? Syntax error, token too long. Okay, so this is sort of a code analyzer. Hey, thing. wait, they had stack overflow in 91? Apparently. <laughs> that's what it says. I mean, it says stack overflow, so. Okay, let's see what else is in here. Uh, we'll go to that folder and see what's in there. There's uh, nothing. nothing in that folder. You're supposed to Whoa, be Whoa, there must have been a lot of There's stuff. There's a lot in that of folder. stuff in that folder there. Oh, my clipboard. That looks fun. Okay. Cut, paste. So you're the just clipboard. like browsing through. Yeah, I'm just browsing through. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Command clear. Uh, this code's not like that messy. Like sometimes this old code you see them using oh here's z and we're gonna stuff something in z and here's i and we're stuffing something in i now and i mean he he's, he's at least kind of naming things he used abbreviations but he's naming stuff there's comments in here too he actually has a block comment here saying something about how you paste stuff uh <laughs> question are we pasting to a table question or question mark and that's an if statement about a table so i think that's legit uh yeah you know it's definitely things. definitely a different way of doing that so yeah, uh, file. this is pretty cool. It is. It's it's fun to read. Remember, I found. Uh, wait, they have grep back then. They use grep. Oh, it's kind of neat. I guess there's it was impressive just reading uh, that what they said it had when they released. Let me find that list there. Uh, his feature list because this guy originally came from uh, Xerox. I guess they they had written. Uh, a board well, processor it, there. It, uh, this article here kind of explains how you know, like WYSIWYG editors, like came into prominence, uh, because apparently word processors back in the day was just like plain text on a DOS terminal or something. That's that's how real men write it, word documents. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, you know, like instead of essentially writing out the statements that command the printer. You essentially, you know, like type in something, then say, oh, make that italic and like move that over a little bit uh, instead of like actually writing out the commands to make that happen. You would just like hit a hot key or something to do that. So, uh, you know, I'd say that this is a worthy piece of uh, computing history. Yes, definitely. This is really good to uh, to uh preserve things like this that way they don't get deleted or hidden forever oh this is an interesting comment it's like in uh, their menu help.c file and it's like put up description of menu so they're doing something with the menu help menu there and this is note this line has been split to rent opus bug 6162 if the following two lines are converted to one then the cs compiler will first save something bar help away before calling some menu since it is in turn might call get submenu, potentially move this module, the save far pointer might be invalidated, and we could have a garbage string in our hands. <laughs> and that gives the guy's name is Brad Verahedin, and this is commented in 4.12.89. So apparently the lines together does something weird that's kind of interesting. Or, or it sounds like the file itself is too long. This line has been split up. This line, I wouldn't be talking about these two lines, would it? Ah. Uh. Let me see here. So there's that goes in and that. Oh, you see that goes into that thing. So you, so I mean, me as a refactoring person, I would maybe move that call, the function call that goes to that variable. I would just move that right into there. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe he's saying if you do that, this makes a bug. Something like a with, compiler bug. Yeah, some sort of a bug. Yeah, the compiler is not dealing with it right. So this is probably one of the things that they found it and they're like, no, this is terrible. So 
anyway, speaking about compilers, uh, Go. Uh, Go? Go? Yeah, Golang uh, is a compiled language. It's one of the, like, since Oracle has decided to be evil, I'm looking for an alternative for my web stuff. And one of those is uh, Go. Uh, the other is Rust. I've heard of Rust. I've heard good things about Rust. I yeah, forget what it was, though. But... It's Mozilla's new language. Aha, okay. They're, uh, uh, was it? They're, they're trying to write a new uh, browser renderer uh, with Rust. Okay. Uh, but, uh, uh, so Golang is what Google has created with, I think it's like Rob Pike which is, like, a computer science god. Uh, let's see, he... I think he was, like, famous for this one operating system called Plan 9 that, like, all the operating system hipsters try to recreate. <laughs> but, uh, uh, like, look it up on Wikipedia or something. Anyways, so uh, Google also uses a lot of Python. So... Uh, apparently they use quite a bit of it in the YouTube front end, and they're trying to look for a implementation of Python that scales better than C Python, the default implementation of Python. So, uh, they decided, you know, they looked at other alternatives and decided to build their own on top of Go, and it's apparently worked out pretty well with them, so they are pretty much releasing it publicly so uh this kind of intrigues me because like i've sort of poked around the uh you know i've sort of like read a few tutorials mm -hmm. but haven't actually done them uh that go is you know pretty much uh you know geared towards you know like web oriented things and things that scale quite a bit so it's actually a language that's aimed at the web instead of Python, where it's like, hey, here's a cool scripting language. It's like, oh, we can run the internet with it. <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, so, you know, Go was built, like, for a lot of scalability and multi-core processing involved. Um, so uh, they decided to, you know, put them together. And uh, so this sort of fits into what I'm looking for, you know, uh, like a new language that's, you know, you know, heavily developed and heavily supported. Uh, you know, granted, it is a Google project, but it is something that Google is actually built on. So, you know, you don't really need to worry about it being on the chopping block, at least in the Since next... It's at least open source, probably. And uh, you really don't need to worry about it for at least the next five years. <laughs> 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 so, um, uh, you know, so it has, you know, the web stuff, and now it has a Python module that I can put my random sentence generator and my blog into. So, like, I still need to figure out, you know, stuff, you know, around the, uh, like, the web templating engine and how that works. And, you know, can I actually re-implement my blog, like, feature for feature uh, in Go? Aha. Uh -huh. So, yeah. Uh, but me converting my blog is still quite a long ways off. <laughs> Like, I haven't written a single line of Go code, and the syntax honestly looks kind of cryptic to me. You have to, uh, do, you have to show it to me, because it sounds like it'd be fun to see. So, interesting fact, Word 1.1 had the number of languages hard-coded in it that it supported. It supported American English, British English, French, German, Dutch, Spanish, Italian, Swedish, French, Canadian, Danish, Norwegian something, and Norwegian something else. In Finnish, Brazil, European, Australian, Portuguese. ah, Portuguese, and then Catalan, Spanish. Yeah, interesting. Essentially, the locales. Aha. Uh -huh. But yes, hard coded. But we'll give him a pass since it was like eighty nine <laughs> and a long eighty six. Sorry, a long time ago. Apparently, I thought they did it in a year because I saw oh because they probably produced it, but then they had the updates to it because yeah, uh, I saw some files dated eighty nine earlier but these are dated 86 cool so um let's talk about something that's actually dead uh cyanogen cyanogen yeah so cyanogen mod is or at least was one of the uh you know the cool third-party android modifications that was really hot like five years ago 
Uh, so the guy that made it uh, decided to, you know, essentially found a company around it. So he did that and like essentially turned into a sort of cloud services company. But I guess that kind of got away from like what they wanted to do and they lost a whole lot of money. Like uh, I think Microsoft invested in into them a little bit, but it didn't help. It did not actually save them. So like uh, last month, they pretty much totally shut down. But people still wanted to run the Cyanogen mod like operating system mm -hmm. and like still develop it, but they couldn't actually retain the name, so it's now called Lineage OS. So, uh, like Cyanogen mod is totally shut down like so much that the blog post that Lineage OS links to <laughs> doesn't go anywhere. It's on archive.org. So thank you archive.org. Do you still have that link to there? Uh, to the archive.org? Yeah. I can probably. Nope. I. I guess you don't have to click on it. Okay. Let's go into some appreciate and deprecate, and I would like to appreciate purge old kernels. Oh. So you might find this pretty interesting. And I, you, I will. So what it is is essentially a uh, Ubuntu command. You don't install it. Oh, it's, by, it, it's, it's already there? Uh, no. You need to install another package if you already have the uh, link up. I, I didn't click on the link. I guess I didn't read that part of the show. Yeah. So uh, what this does is essentially what it does on the label. It deletes all your old kernel images that's filling up your boot directory. So if you scroll up there, it's provided by that. Oh wow, that's a very cryptic package name. Just the first five letters. Ah, come the... back, come back. Don't go away. There yeah, we the go. Biobu. Biobu. Sudo in yeah, after install. B Y O B U. B Y O Oh we found it. Yep. Perfect. So like this Biobu thing is uh, like something that's sort of like it's a multi terminal type of package. You can quickly create and move between different windows over an SSH connection, single SSH connection or TTY terminal. Uh, split each of those windows into multiple panes, etc. So you wouldn't think that this useful <laughs> feature would be in this very obscure package that totally doesn't do what it d says on the label. Currently not. So but hey, if it does so sudo. So sudo yeah, purge. I guess it probably needs sudo threads for that one. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I want to pull your brain out. Can I do that? I say, <laughs> no, but you can't touch my brain without permission. <laughs> so, yeah. Following package, you're going to install, blah, blah, blah. So it's going to wipe out a bunch of different ones. So let's just do sanity check and find what I'm actually using. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I came across this a while back. So it looks like the latest one is 5.7. As long as it's not trying to delete 5.7, we're good. Yeah. Okay, so we're seeing about 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 of them. So we'll just go ahead and say yes and let it operate in my brain. <laughs> After this operation, 1,128 megs of disk space will be freed. I have free space again. How much do you have left on here? Oh, we can find that out. D-F-H. H. And apparently I had 8.2 gigs free. When solid state drives get down to terabyte to about $100, I'll buy one probably and put one in that or I'll buy a new laptop. Is my screen's been getting a little bit cracky sounding lately. I think the hinge is going, so it may be coming down to its last legs. We'll see how that goes. Oh, though. cracky when you close it? Yeah, when you kind of like close it, open it thing, you can kind of hear it in there. It's not like yeah, because because screens screens should not make noise under operation. The screen itself isn't isn't making noise. It's the hinge is making the noise there. Glad you clarified yes, that. Yes, yes. I guess there is a difference there. So, so I, I wonder will this run Grub after it's done? Because it'd be kind of nice if it let the bootloader know that hey, you can't boot into this brain anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so. uh... I forget off the top of my head the uh, grub command to do that. I think or... you just did a studio update grub. But what Something I'm saying like is that. it'd be nice if it did it 
for me when I'm done. Wait, it already did that. Ah, perfect. So it's, it but, looks like each one, it's it's running it again. Oh, so it, it removes one, it runs Grub, and then it removes the next one. Yeah. Yeah, okay. It gets the job done if you keep after it. So you can set this up as a cron job, then run it like once a month. Or uh, not cron tab, it's the uh, uh, anacron. Anacron? Yeah, which, you know, sort of takes into effect it's like oh your computer might not be on all the time ah. so you can like run things at boot oh, or go. log in or something you can you can run cron at boot too unless it's just another name for the kind of like how vim and vi is technically different but you can prefer that there is vi i don't know so um yeah i found that a little useful so uh. this would be nice for my desktop where I, for whatever reason, have a really small partition for the boot drive. And so every now and then I try to do an update, and it's like, we're sorry, but we can't update. And I'm like, really? Why was that? <laughs> so, all right. Well, um, apparently you have an IoT thing to talk an about. IoT thing? I'll have to check the thing. Oh, right! Feats! My garage door now has a REST API on it. So you can, like, you know, say slash garage door slash open? Uh, I, I think I use the word toggle, but yes, that that's the concept. And it just goes, you know, because it doesn't know if the garage door is up, down, or halfway up and down. And so it just acts as a button, a big red button. And, oh, I actually have, I even have a GitHub for it. We can do that. So um, how exactly do you toggle a half open garage door? How do you toggle a ha- the same way as if you had a uh if you had a garage door remote and you push the button when it's halfway up, halfway down. Same oh. Way. So you essentially made a rest API for your garage door opener. Yes. Well, well that mimics the, the functionality. It mimics the functionality of the opener, that's correct. Uh maybe a feature functionality if it was uh, you know, useful enough we could uh, add sensors to let it know if the garage door is up if it's down what have you so anyways the interesting file here is this python script my first python website thingy so basically it just somehow finds its ip address that it is because i need it later it sets up that it has a garage door thing so you can get the page uh ideally someday we have a status we know but then you toggle it and it makes it go places so you have a get stats, and it has a simple website with a big giant red button on it, <laughs> like orange or something like that. And uh, yeah, I do the substitute thingy to inject IP address. And then when you actually toggle it, you go ahead and set your pin to out. You your GPIO and, stuff. Yep, yep, you set it high, you wait for half a second, and you set it low again. <laughs> and then you might let them know that it was toggled, but that code doesn't work. But the door works even though the code doesn't tell you that it worked. And that's okay. <laughs> and right now it's installed in a five-gallon bucket suspended from a ceiling. So <laughs> the code looks like the garage door opener does. <laughs> Long term, I, I, I already have a 3D printed case for it, but it needs to be expanded now because I had to do an adapter for the, the relay. I needed to flip a low signal into a high signal, uh, or vice versa, actually. So... Uh, I I can show you the HTML too. Well, uh, put this in the show notes. Oh, right. That's, I was going to do that, but I totally forgot to do that. Uh, Restart. Yeah, sure, right there. Perfect. Uh, yes. So, um, yeah. So, I, I need to uh, create my own printed circuit board to do that conversion. I need to find a 3D printed case that fits it, probably design one fast. And then... Uh, buy a couple of parts for it and hopefully we can uh, go from there i guess but yeah right now it's in a, that five gallon bucket this seems to be a very light page for jquery seems to be a very very light page for jquery yeah but you do do ajax there so yeah i think i was just googling stuff but i was like oh hey look at that you can do it with jquery for doing the ajax call i think is why i pulled yeah. that one in it cool. got the job done and the targeted uh, device was Android phones, so it displays nice on a phone. On your computer, it looks like that. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, well, uh, before you do your, well, purge old kernels, you probably should have uh, observed International Backup Awareness Day. 
but this is Linux. Yes, yeah, this is Linux. Nothing ever goes wrong or gets hacked, right? <laughs> well, at least you can rescue it easily. At least. So, um, do you have a separate partition for your boot uh, things on this? It looks like this one. Let's There's see boot EFI, but that's... I don't see a separate boot in this. So my desktop has a separate one for the boot. But uh, since I mostly put most of my files I use in Dropbox... It's okay, but very annoying if I have to re-image this one. I did find a make file for uh, for the Windows word processor. I wonder if I can make it compile in Linux, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> that would be classic, to just have, you know, word for running on your Linux box and, you know, compile it. Well, if you, if you could uh, figure out all the dependencies... Yeah, it looks like it has some EXEs that depends upon there, and I don't know if you can maybe cheat and use Wine a little bit and kind of get around it well uh see the thing about compiling c and c plus plus is that i can't except for one thing that's moz jpeg moz jpeg is the only thing that i've downloaded the source from and figured out how to shovel it into a compiler by myself like everything else i've tried no it has been very difficult i've done a very few things but i remember different times this some things you just try and there's like this dependency is like oh great i'll get that and you get it it's like yes i got past that one now and so then you try another thing and it's like, oh we have this other dependency we need and so yeah. you get that one it's like oh wait there there's another one and, it's and just then, like and then, then, then the cycle repeats like i don't know 12 times and maybe at some point it freaks out. I was like, no, I don't need that version. I need this earlier like, one. Oh, the other version. That's completely impossible to find. But then you run away screaming and crying. Yes. But I, I've had some success. So if it's well documented in a famous package and like it's made to be compiled-ish on that, that OS, then sometimes it works. I feel like this one's a little bit off the beaten path, though, maybe. Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> Uh, at least for Moz JPEG, it is sufficiently self-contained. Like there's, like hardly any dependencies on that. Like there's go. like maybe three that you can just like pseudo app to get. See, that makes it a little bit easier when it's self-contained. So, so I'm not even that quite up. Can I just say make go like make file? Is it? Do you call it go in and like say make file or something like that? Or just just make. But it's been a while, so I'm in the. I'm gonna guess that I want the ETA thing. So, um, well, uh, as for that, I guess that's pretty much it for this episode. Um, yeah, I guess I will keep doing whatever it is I'm doing, and you will keep trying to maybe compile that. <laughs> maybe, or at least get a crazy error message. So, um, so yeah, have a good one. You too.